Hey, welcome to the Art Condition Podcast, a weekly show that will discuss the business, community, and often undiscussed stress and mental health concerns of being a professional artist or even a serious hobbyist. I'm Joby. I've been in the tattoo and illustration professions for 25 years. My co-host is Moose, a data analyst, social media manager, and art agent. If you enjoy the content, please consider visiting the Patreon page and the show notes to help support the effort. Or if that's not an option, please like, subscribe, leave a good review, or just share with your friends. And definitely go visit the links of our guests on this episode. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. Yeah, please, while I fix this egregious error on my part, um, please tell us please tell us all about you. Um, a brief history of your background, how you came into art, and what brings you here today. Awesome. Well, my name is Heather R. Hitchman, spelled H-E-A-T-H-E-R-H-I-T-C-H-M-A-N. <laughs> uh, and I am an artist and world builder. I'm creating a paranormal fairy tale world called Teratoff, filled with art and stories that I created. So I think the first part of your question was, how did I get into art? Um, basically been doing art since I can remember like I've always loved drawing I would draw Bambi a lot when I was a kid and Looney Tunes and um, when I discovered what anime was I drew a lot of anime so I just drew 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 all the time um, and when I was a kid I was very much into all kinds of different artistic activities like I did theater I was a competitive singer for a while. I tried to pick up guitar, but I was not so good at it. Um, and no matter what extracurricular activity I tried, it always kind of came back to art and drawing. And for a time, I thought that I might get into the video industry and like work in video production or kind of bring my stories and ideas to life with like the video media. But uh, once I got to college, I found out that doing that kind of uh, venture on your own isn't really possible. So I want, and I was learning also that uh, working with other people in the industry wasn't necessarily a great fit for me either, <laughs> um, as you can probably imagine. <laughs> uh, so I started to become interested in something, something I could do to bring my ideas and my art and my stories to life kind of on my own. And that's when I started going to conventions and meeting other independent artists that just made art and they sold it. And somewhere like in my mind, I knew that that existed, like artists make art and they sell it, but I had no idea like how it actually worked. Like, how do you find people that want to buy the art? How do you know what kind of art to make? How, how much do you sell it for? Like, where do you go to connect with the people that want to buy the art? And so once I started meeting other artists and reading about their experiences and going to conventions and kind of seeing how it all worked together and paying more attention to social media and stuff like that, I started to realize, wait, I can do this. Like, this is something I could do for the most part on my own. And so I started to follow that path and here we are today. I'm a totally independent artist. I don't do work with any other companies. Sometimes I get commissions, uh, but they're always based on the art that I'm already creating, which is awesome because I get paid by other random people to make art that I would have already made, or they incorporate some great idea that they came up with that I might not have thought of on my own. So that's what I'm doing today. Which is a fantastic endorsement, you know, not just for your project, which we're going to talk about in a sec, um, but I also feel like it's an invitation to, you know, anybody who remains skeptical, uh, you know, of this, I, they, they lack the faith in like their own ideas and their own work. It's like, no, you can definitely find um, an audience, you know, a, a you know, a group of people that are going to latch on to what it is that you're doing, even to the degree that they will want fan art and commissions from your very own world building project, <laughs> you know, like not necessarily Dragon Ball or comic books or whatever, but like the shit that you're making, you just got to keep doing it. So in that, tell us about Teratov. What is, uh, what is Teratov? Where did the idea come from and what is it built into? So Teratov, excuse me, 
Teratoff was an idea that I had like as a little girl. Um, I am an immigrant, so I know I have a American accent, but I'm actually from the UK and uh, we immigrated when I was about nine. And I don't know why, maybe I was just like a really weird kid, but I got picked on a lot. Um, I got picked on a lot for being weird. I got picked on for being really uh, extra. I got picked on for uh, being English, which is like, in retrospect, really weird. Right. But I just had a really hard time fitting in. And it was like, I felt like I had nowhere that I belonged. And I was struggling to find that. And I just started to come up with this idea of like, what if there was a place where I could go in my mind where I belonged and I was safe and all of my, all of the things that I wish could be real could be there like unicorns and dragons and like amazing quests. Like my friends and I, we would uh, like during recess while the other friends were like playing sports or climbing on the jungle gym and stuff, we would make up these stories and we would act them out and we would even draw like pictures and I actually found some recently while we were moving and it was really trippy to see some of these things like from, you know, 25 years ago. And that's I've awesome. kind of reimagined it into something totally new today. So that's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> so it was like a childhood idea and granted Teratov is very different now from what it was when I was a kid. It was like very, much inspired by all my favorite media at the time. Like it was very Sailor Moon at one point, And then another point, it was very Oliver and company. Like there was just a bunch of different uh, influences from all of the different things that I love that came into it. And then as I got older and I wanted to just follow that path of becoming an independent artist, I started to kind of think of all of the ideas that I had over the years. And I kept coming back to this idea of Teratov and this place where I was safe, where all of my dreams could come true, where I could have fun with my friends and we could go on adventures together. And uh, through talking to uh, actually my husband a lot, because he's really passionate about storytelling as well, and about learning about storytelling in general, I refined the story and narrowed down my influences to something more concise and came up with this paranormal fairy tale idea. So it kind of combines uh, all of the best things of Halloween and Christmas. It's like there's this spooky element with the corrupted rotten creatures that are haunting the world and creating mischief. And then there are the winnow creatures that are pure and filled with good magic that are spreading like good vibes and happiness around the realm. And these two forces are fighting against each other. So, and the different stories represent like kind of different realizations I've had just growing up. Uh, and I've incorporated a lot of that into the story itself. I'm curious. Um, what do you think it is that drives people that have never seen Teratov before to start caring about it? Because a few weeks ago we had um, uh, D and D module makers on, and they said that adventures or world books by themselves don't sell well because the community isn't invested in those worlds. So, how do you get a community invested in Teratov? I think the number one thing that gets people hooked on it is the combination of a heartfelt story and art that they like to look at. So if somebody really likes fawns and not a ton of people by comparison to like dragons and unicorns draw fawns. Um, if they see one of those pieces and then they see a story that goes along with it that they can relate to, that is seems to me to be the thing that gets the people that are really diehard like Teratov fans, Teratovians for life interested in it and I think that they see my dream in it that you know I want to make books with a lot of illustrations and to tell these stories eventually and so when I talk about that dream of mine they get on board with it because they see that possibility in like the little story so it's like I'm already kind of doing it it's just in little pieces so it gets them excited to read more and they want to help me make more 
Yeah. And the majority of your world building and your storytelling happens on Patreon, right? Yeah. So the majority of, you know, our, our time, I think will be spent on, you know, like how, what that looks like and, and how you, how you do that. But leading into that, I want to spend a little bit of time, um, on like how Teratov sort of, you know, how you came to realize that Teratov was the thing, what its look was going to be. Um, and m above all sort of like having the courage to like, take that step, you know, like, okay, this is the thing that I'm going to do. And I have the guts to commit fully to that. Um, and to lead into that, there's this great, you, there's a post that is public on your, your Patreon. And we'll have links to this in the show notes, um, where you kind of detail, like how you got started working with Patreon, um, and the lead up to that. And from that the initial story, there's this great quote in there. Um, it's a short exchange between you and your husband, but I don't, maybe he wasn't your husband at the time. Um, but anyway, it, this is the quote you say, I spent all that time and money going to college for animation. I whimpered as I gazed out the car window. So I have to get a job in that industry. But what if you didn't have to? Tad asked in reply. Tad is your husband. The industry is killing you. I know it's not what you really want to do. He was right. It wasn't. But for so many years, I had believed that making it in the animation industry was the only way to make my real dream into reality. All I had ever wanted was a place to bring my characters and the world they live in to life. Facing the fact that was never going to happen on my current path was soul crushing. This, there, that is a huge amount of, um, there's a, there's a huge amount encapsulated in that, I think for, um, many artists and yeah. I, I, I would like maybe how, if you could briefly, <laughs> if, if briefly is possible, cause it is like such a big question um take us from that like that moment you know where you're like making this like really hard confrontation um to like okay this is this is what i'm going to do and finding like the bravery to make that commitment wow <laughs> uh i <laughs> that was like i was like getting teary-eyed like while you're reading it because i was like i remember like how sad i was when i was going through that and I think the biggest thing for me at that time emotionally was like, I was so terrified to tell my, to like actually accept and realize that I hated what I was doing. I was so afraid that if I just said, I hate this, I hate it and I don't want to do it anymore, that that would just make me a big failure and everyone would point and laugh at me and that there would be absolutely no coming back from that at all. And when I actually finally just like accepted, like I hate animation, I've tried it for so long and I'm never going to like it. I just felt so free. Like mm -hmm. finally, I'm not just like lying to myself that like I have to like this thing that I put, you know, a considerable amount of time and energy and money into pursuing and that it wasn't going to be the end of the world. It was actually the first day of a new world. And I am so glad that we had that conversation because had we not had it, like I might have continued pressing on to try to get into the animation industry and keep working in television and all of those things and being miserable the whole time because I was so afraid of like being a failure. But really it was like, okay, so I tried doing this thing for a while and I found out I didn't like it and I wasn't that great at it but I can direct my energy instead to something that's going to make me so freaking happy. And I'm going to be way better at than I ever was at this other thing that I tried. And once I accepted those feelings of like, yes, I might feel regret about this because that was another thing I was like really dreading the feeling of regret, just like taking over. Once I accepted like, yes, I might feel regret for a time, but I'll feel way more regret if I never try this. And honestly, now it's been, that conversation was uh, maybe like 
it was before we were married. So it's been like maybe like eight years and I don't regret anything. Like I don't even regret going to college for animation. I don't regret the time and the energy that I put into it or the path that I ventured down for it for a little while because I still learned a lot. And those experiences did take part into leading me where I am today. So even like that fear of regret, like that regret went away. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. that anyone that's thinking about if you like really do some some deep like soul searching and ask yourself like am I really happy or am I trying to convince myself that I'm happy because for xyz I feel like I'm supposed to be happy doing this mm -hmm. so how long after you made the decision to make the switch uh, was there a time a, 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 like a grace period you gave yourself to like feel uncomfortable about it or were you comfortable at it and you know from the, from the get go and you never turned back um, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um, so when this happened, it was right after I had left a particularly draining job at a studio. So um, I was kind of, and we had moved in with my parents. So I was kind of like off floating in the job and profession void. Like I don't do anything right now. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of figuring it out. and. Um, because we were living with my parents, uh, I did have a little bit of like time and grace to be able to figure out what this would look like for me. Um, because normally I'm so hyper focused on making sure that our basic needs are met. And I think um, I was so focused on that. It took me getting to the point where like I had lost the job, I had to move in with my parents and I didn't have to think about those things anymore in the immediate future to really sit back and think about what I really wanted to do. So getting back to your question, was there a transition? There was a transition and there were in some ways and there were some ways that I picked it up right away. So immediately like my day to day completely changed because I was used to just like being on call with like uh, studios from around the world 24 seven. I was used to wrangling artists and actors and all sorts of things. and. That was just all over. I was used to living in Florida. Now we're back in New Jersey in that basement with my parents' house and like everything just kind of changed overnight. So um, I knew that I had to just like get started. So how I just kind of started doing that was I would get up every day and I would, I was still kind of taking commission work at that time, but I made sure to take a good portion of my day and work on my own art. I had notebooks every morning that I would write Teratoff stuff in. This was the time where I actually figured out a lot of what the world would look like and how it felt and what influences I was going to actually take and put into it. The part that was more of a transition was kind of reintroducing myself to the world as an artist because at the time, up until then, uh, I had been posting all of the art I had been doing for commissions. And it was a variety of stuff from pet portraits to portraits of people in like a really realistic style to portraits of people in fantastical clothing to some, I did like some furry commissions. I did like a range of stuff. Like basically, if you would pay me to draw it and it wasn't like R rated or above, I would draw it for you. Oh, it was fine. Uh, I even did freelance writing for a while that is not going to surface, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at that time, I also realized, you know, I consider myself a fantasy artist. I consider myself someone that likes to do fairy tale art and someone that likes to do like um, a mix of like spooky and cute stuff. But then like I took a look at all of the art I had been making and I was like, all of this art I have been making is none of those things that. I actually consider myself. I'm spending all of my time and energy making this art that doesn't align with the art that I actually want to make. Like it doesn't look like this vision I have in my head. So even though I was still accepting commissions because I still did have to pay some bills, I made a commitment to myself to not post any of that commission work and only post my original artwork. So mm -hmm. there was a transition where like the older fans kind of moved on and fell away and new fans came and people that actually liked this new stuff started to show up. And that was really encouraging because I had never tried 
doing that before. I'd only shared like commission art. And so like, and you know, commission art, it's really relevant to the person that commissions it, but in general, it's not really relevant to anyone else. So when I started making my own art, um, I was a little worried, like, well, is this only going to be relevant to me? What if nobody cares? Like, what if nobody wants to read a story about a unicorn that gets really hurt, but it's actually like a metaphor for when I hit my brother in the base of a baseball bat by accident. Like, what <laughs> if nobody wants to see that? But people did. And they started the like snowball effect kind of started to happen. I could take less and less commissions because it started to become more financially, uh, it made more financial sense for me to just make my own art and sell that because I could make, I got to the point over uh, several years that I could do that versus a commission. Mm-hmm. So it was a little bit of call in May started with, you know, my feet running, getting to work, but it took a a little while for me to actually see the results and for the audience turnover to kind of happen. Yeah. We're talking about uh, Patreon. What was the early days of your Patreon like? Oh, wow. It was really exciting and scary. (laughs) Um, I heard about Patreon initially on a podcast and It was like before anyone, any other artists that I knew were actually using it. And I think at the time it was like a band that was talking about using it. And I thought, oh, well, that's really cool for like bands. That that sounds like a nice thing that they can do. And then um, over, I think it was like a year or so from that point that I started hearing more and more artists using it. And so I thought, hmm maybe I could use this. And I kind of connected the dots. Well, if I want to make my own independent art, you know, I I can't rely on the uh, instant gratification and recognizability of making fan art, because that's the best benefit to making that kind of work is that you have a built in audience already. I was cultivating my own audience from, from nothing. So I realized that I could use Patreon as a way to kind of further me along on that journey and help me financially to be able to continue to work on the art and nothing else while I was making it. So in the early days, um, I was nervous because, again, there is that fear of failure. Like, what if it doesn't work? What if people don't want to give me a dollar every month? Uh, What if I screw it up? But I made a date for myself. I told the internet that this was the day it was going to be ready and it was ready and it launched. And um, I got my first patrons and I had some interaction and it was just, it was just so gratifying. And I just knew that this is something that I can stick with. This is something that I like doing. And this is something that I think is going to really like help Teratoff get out there and be sustainable. So I, I want to jump back just for a second um, and speak to that um, commitment that you made to yourself because you're, you're confronting this like fear, you know, like what if nobody wants to give me that dollar? And that is a huge fear <clears throat> for so many people that like people just yeah. aren't going to want to do it. So now you're sitting at the other end of this. You're like living proof, you know, uh, a, a, a case study in, you know, success at just shitting your pants and jumping right in. I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, looking back, you know, or if you were talking to, you know, a younger, less experienced artist, uh, like even in the chat right now, you know, someone is saying they've been thinking for a long time about starting a Patreon, starting to, you know, promote their own work. Is there something that that you that you would have liked to hear or that you think other people might want to hear about, you know, taking that first set of steps that will kind of like. I don't, I don't want to say pep talk, you know, but. Help reassure them that, you know, it it can be done and perhaps maybe even it should be done. I think the biggest thing that helps me to take the plunge and to feel confident that as long as I put in the time that, you know, they will come was looking at other artists that did it well. And um, they very graciously 
uh, took the time to speak to me one on one to give me some advice. So like a couple very good artist friends of mine that were doing really well, like, and um, I had previously talked to them many times on other occasions, just about art and things in general. And when I told them, I want to start a Patreon, can we like have a chat? Can you talk to me? Like, they were very nice and sat down and uh, told me everything that, you know, that I should do, all of the things that they wish they hadn't done. Uh, one of the big ones was, um, don't do mail-in rewards. They'll kill you. I did them anyway, oh, and they're no. killing me. Oh. <laughs> but I actually have a plan for that. We can talk about later. Yeah, if you guys we definitely will. That topic more. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, really, it was a lot of... Uh, learning from just watching other people that are doing it well it was kind of how i got into art in uh into like this whole idea of being an independent artist at all was seeing that other artists were doing it so i just kind of applied that principle here as well like okay well there are artists out there that are making thousands of dollars on patreon like are any of them my good friends will they talk to me and luckily they were so having the experience to be able to talk to artists one-on-one -on -one was a really good thing. The other thing that I really recommend people do and what really helped put me at ease was uh, become a patron first before you have a Patreon. Um, every different platform has their own like culture, you know, like how people behave on Instagram, how they behave on Facebook and how they behave on Twitter. They're all different like they all kind of like have their own rules and the understandings of like what certain reactions mean and like there are things you can get away with on facebook that would be really annoying if you did it on twitter like and vice versa mm -hmm. so being a patron first was a really good experience for me to just learn how the platform works and to learn like what i liked and what i didn't like and to learn what kind of content i liked and didn't like um i always Think to myself whenever I'm thinking about putting out a new piece of work or a new product, would I buy it? I don't like to sell something I wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't feel genuine. And I feel like I'm also really bad at selling things that I wouldn't buy because I just I wouldn't buy it. So I'm gonna do a really shitty job in convincing you to buy it. And a lot <laughs> of artists are just bad at selling things, period. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that plays into it, too. That was another right. skill that like, I had to learn. Um, but for me, I guess my selling strategy is just liking what I make and wanting to share it with other people. Um, it's just a shame that uh, capitalism exists and I can't share it for free. Like, you got to give me some money. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, a lot of what you did um, right from the beginning seemed like things that uh, would otherwise have taken you months or maybe I don't who knows how long of like trial and error. Um, and so you, you talked a little bit about, you know, linking up with fellow artists who are doing reasonably well already with it. Uh, you, you became a, a Patreon, a, a patron. Um, was there anything else that you did that you mentioned um, in, again, in this article that I referenced earlier, uh, you referenced doing months of preparation. Um, so what, was there anything else that you did that you feel like kind of was valuable in that initial uh, kicking off of the, your, your, your own Patreon page? Yeah, so I made my Patreon months ahead of my public launch in secret. Mm -hmm. And I just practiced using it and like made posts knowing that no one was there, but pretending that they were just to kind of give myself get myself in the headspace of making content regularly there, but without the pressure of, I got to say it just the right way or make this post like work right. Because I mean, Patreon was a fairly new platform. It was buggy sometimes. So it would have broken my heart if I put a post out with an image and for whatever reason, like the image didn't pop up and I wouldn't know why, you know, I wanted to make sure I understood how the platform worked. And then after about like a week or so, I invited some like very inner circle people to be my patrons, like my mom and like some people that have bought work from me regularly and my sister and like some really, really good friends. Like, Hey, 
you know that I want to do art for a living. I'm trying this new platform. Um, it would really mean a lot to me if you could uh, join me with this. Like if you make a pledge um, and just like help interact with me on the site so I can get used to it. You know, you can cancel whenever you want. Like it would just really help me out if you could um, be like one of my first backers. And pretty much all of them have stayed the entire time. And many of them pledged more than just $1. So it was really encouraging to have that early support from my inner circle. And that helped me feel really confident, like when I actually launched it. And the other benefit of doing that um, little kind of sneak private launch is that when it did go public and people saw it, there was already content there. It wasn't just an empty page. Like there were posts where people were commenting and they were leaving their opinions on things or they were asking me questions and they could see that like I interact there regularly because one of the things that I noticed when I was solely a patron, um, I really appreciated when the creators would um, interact back with us and do it like in a timely manner. I think that sometimes creators might kind of leave Patreon for last. And that makes me sad because these are the people that are giving you money every month to be able to keep making what you're making. They should be first. You know? mm -hmm. um, and there were a couple campaigns where I did stop my pledge because I would see that they were posting on Instagram every day and they were responding to those comments like immediately. And then they were leaving their patrons like in the cold. And that kind of made me feel like, well, why am I giving you like this extra support when you're paying way more attention to these other people that are just watching you for free? And I understand like there's an algorithm game you got to play. I know that because I'm trying to play the same game. But like how the bottle flow works is like you want to get other people from these other platforms to your Patreon. Like that's the end goal. So that's where we should be like coming together to really celebrate this thing and spend like exclusive time together. So I think some people sometimes get it backwards because they want to have like 10,000 people on Instagram or whatever. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm making you feel bad. <laughs> Not at all. No, um, you're giving me necessary reminders of, uh, of, of prioritization. Um, maybe there'll be time later on to it, it'll it'll circle back but this is something that i know that i need to deal with so I, i'm sure other, it'll be good for other people to hear you know that Insta instagram is so insidious in its ability to possess your mind um <laughs> it's i feel in some ways not it it's almost has this like demonic kind of feel you know what I mean? Like, because it doesn't really like give a lot for as much as it takes and as much as it asks and yeah. like demands on the part of its participants. And then it gives you almost nothing and you feel like garbage and you're this is so weird. Um, and then, and so then like when, yeah, when you say like people are paying so much attention to that and then leaving Patreon for last and it's so inverted I think that speaks to like how powerful uh, Instagram is. And I think it's like, a, it's an invitation to like a little, it's a good slap in the face of like, come on, man, like wake up. Let's like refocus anyway. Um, when, uh, as you were to get back to what you were saying, you know, you're, you're building up this momentum. You mentioned that, you know, having that sort of like initial, um, inner circle of people gave you the confidence. And then when people came in, they were seeing that it was already like active. Um, it, so is that what sort of made you feel like you were ready to give a, um, you know, the official launch for your Patreon? And if not, like, what was the point when you were like, okay, I'm ready to make this fully live to the public. And what did you do for that? Mm, okay. So, I can't remember if I did it on purpose or not, okay. but the date that I picked was actually the day of my first convention. So it was a very stressful evening. Like I remember being at the hotel for the convention and like when you've never done a convention before, there's just like so many questions and there's so many things you don't know what to do. So I was 
like preparing my mind for that, but also like I had to finish my Patreon page and like my friends and I were up till like one in the morning, like editing the page together and they're like reading over my words and making sure there's no spelling mistakes and things like that. So um, in hindsight, that might've not been the best day to launch, but that was the day I picked and I'm all about sticking to my word. So that's what I did. <laughs> Uh, and it it worked out. It, it, it kind of worked out in the way that I could cross promote the two things. Like, mm. hey, I'm on my Patreon talking about my first convention. Like, because I was posting about it on Instagram and Facebook. But I was like, but if you really want to know the skinny, come to my Patreon. That's where I'm really talking about all the nitty gritty. So in that way, it kind of worked out. It was just, it was a little crazy. But I did it. I dug into my energy reserves and I figured it out. I'm getting a little lost in my train of thought. Was that the answer to your question or was there another part to it? Uh, the, the the second part, I guess, was like, a, like a, if, if there is any more detail about what your like grand unveiling looked like um, logistically as well as um, visually, you know, was there anything special that you did to make it an event? And what did that look like? I'm pretty sure back when Facebook events were more of a thing, I had a mm -hmm. Facebook event. Mm -hmm. So I invited people to that, uh, whether they were just going to follow or pledge or encourage the endeavor. Like I invited a bunch of people to come and join in the celebration. I changed all of my uh, YouTube banners, my Twitter banner, my Instagram thing to like all be about the Patreon to like announce this big arrival. I did a new video, so I did my launch video for my Patreon. I actually need to update it because that was back when I had purple hair, so it's probably like really confusing, so I need to make another one. Um, what else did I do? I had just been talking about it a lot for, for weeks, and like as the date came closer and closer, I kind of like revved up the engines more, like it's coming, we're getting closer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a big thing. And um, yeah, I just made sure everybody knew that this is the place where I'm going to be posting all of the Teratov art and stories. This is where you need to go if you want to read them all, because everywhere else you're just going to get a snippet. If you want to see the whole thing, you got to come here. In... I got a new question. Sorry, what was that? I had to cough. Oh. <laughs> could you, next time, could you please just cough right into the microphone? So we, anyway. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> this isn't an ASMR channel. <laughs> um, that would be like the worst ASMR ever. Maybe, maybe burps would be worse. But um, So you have, uh, in that article, you speak a bit about branding. Um, and, you know, sort of like everything sort of just like becomes Terra Toff, you know, in, in, in one way or the other. It all gets hold it into that. Um, do you have any experience or, or background in marketing? Not really official. Uh, I have not gone to like any specific kind of college course or anything like that. I think I learned a lot about branding though in my time at working at Disney World. Mm -hmm. That was probably where I picked up a lot of the understanding of what marketing is, how it works and how powerful it can be and the kind of marketing that speaks to me. So I've always been a fan of Disney and I've always been a fan of the parks. I remember when we immigrated, the only reason why I was cool with it was because my parents said that we were going to go to Disney World. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, we'll take you to Disney World. And I was like, all right, I'll go to America then. Sounds just wonderful. <laughs> Going to meet Mickey Mouse, right? So I, this I'm total aside. I'm just have to comment that I'm loving a person from the UK doing a bad impersonation of somebody from the UK. <laughs> it's blowing my mind. Anyway, please continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so when we moved, uh, when we were living in Florida, I ended up getting a part time job at a certain point working at the parks. And it was like a pretty fun job. And one of the things that they teach you is the, the culture of like being a cast member or that's their special word for employee. Um, 
and all of the different kind of secret things that go on that really get out of here, fly, that really aren't so secret, that kind of make you feel immersed in the experience. So things like there are these little hidden like vents in the sidewalks that have different smells that come up and those mm -hmm. different smells are supposed to like make you feel certain things when you're in certain areas and like how the music is arranged and how the cast members that are the theatrical ones will interact with you, how they'll call you prince and princess to make you feel like you're a part of this world that they're making. Like the whole concept behind Disney World and every decision about like how it's put together and how it's made is to make you feel like you have left the real world and now you're in a new world. Like you can't just walk out of Disney World and like go back to new life. There's like, or to real life. There's like a whole process to it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of annoying when you have to do it all the time. But like, as, as someone that's on vacation, it becomes like part of the ritual, part of that transition from, I am leaving my boring, normal life and going onto this magical adventure where I'm going to meet all of these characters and eat wonderful food and none of my worries exist. And that's how a lot of people see Disney World. Um, so I definitely embrace that idea with my World of Teratoff and my booth that I do at conventions and my Patreon. So, for example, it would be really easy and take a lot less time. And Tad would be really happy if when we got to a convention, all we did was throw up some uh, pro panels and stick the art on it and call it a day. We don't do that. I like to treat it as much like it's its own theme park that I can. Now, granted, my budget is not a Disney budget and I do not have the same square footage, but I make do with what I have. So I do things like hanging the red roses across the top. I have the curtain that drapes across it in a certain way um, instead of having just like a regular art stand. I make sure that I get cast iron black ones and make sure that everything just kind of works together so that when you're standing in front of my booth, you're not at the convention anymore. You're at Teratoff. You've come to like a new place that you're visiting. Um, and I've played around with some other things. Like I played around with music. That didn't work. Uh, mostly because I have a really hard time talking to people when like there's other words going on. So like when there's mm -hmm. music, I can, I'm paying too much attention to the words being spoken. But now I've actually been commissioning Teratoff music from a composer for my YouTube videos. So when we do do cons again, maybe I'll start doing that because that music's all instrumental. So mm -hmm. I might be able to talk over that while of course being respectful to my fellow booth mates and not playing my music too loud so as to disturb anybody else around me hint hint i always hate when people do that <laughs> uh -huh. um so and so there's just like all these like little like every opportunity that you have to make the the thing look like it belongs in the world to me that's branding Anything that you can do to make that person feel like they've been immersed in a new environment and not stand, they for, they have to forget where they actually are. So that's why when I'm at my booth, I ask them if they want me to tell them a story and I have certain stories memorized and I'll tell them. I make it like a big like kind of theatrical thing where I tell the story to people. Um, with Patreon, that means that every opportunity that I have to write a thing, I write it as if I am in Teratoff telling you about my adventures there. Mm -hmm. So I could have just made a list for my tiers saying, in this tier, you get this thing and you get that thing. And then you also get that thing. But instead, I write something like, congratulations, you have entered the Kitsune Messenger tier for $5. Uh, for your dedication to the realm, the queen has bestowed upon you the most beautifulest gift that she can muster. Like, I <laughs> make it sound frilly and exhausting like that. <laughs> um, and there's so many really great opportunities to do that on a platform like Patreon that I don't always see people taking advantage of. Like, if you can put a picture there, put a picture there because people love to look at things quickly rather than read things 
I'm trying to do more video now so that I don't have to have people dedicate so much time because my stories are getting longer as I get to be a better writer and the world expands and there's more that I want to say with it. The writing that used to be like maybe a few sentences can now get to like a couple pages. Mm. So now I'm making videos that have me reading the story aloud and the words are also scrolling by. So hopefully that is also helping anyone who might have uh, issues with like auditory issues or reading issues. Like one of those two things will hopefully communicate the story to the viewer. Um, with branding your Patreon, I also uh, highly recommend, you know, having a beautiful big banner uh, having a video, there's so many creators that don't do a video, but I really think that they should because uh, like I mentioned before, when we were talking about uh, Instagram versus Patreon, Patreon is where they have come to take the next step and invest in your dream. This is where they are. They want to like take a step through the veil and see more. And that includes you as a creator. So if you feel able um, make videos, even if you think that you are terrible at video. Um, uh, one of the women that I actually spoke to before who gave me a lot of tips on Patreon, she did not have a video. And I asked her, like, why don't you have a video? And she said, oh, I'm just really awful at them. I feel really shy and I wouldn't know what to say. And I'm like, I know that you're shy, but I also know that you're like really adorable and your shyness is kind of like what makes you that way. And mm -hmm. I think that it would be really great to see a video from you someday. So she actually hired a videographer to help her with the video. And the way that he did it is really good. Like it actually does highlight how shy uh, and kind of insecure she is, but it just makes her really likable and it just makes you feel attached to her and the work and the idea behind it even more. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm trying to say is take advantage of all of like anything that you get to customize in it in the, your Patreon campaign, customize it, take advantage of it, fill it out, make it feel like it's a part of whatever kind of world you're creating or whatever it is that you're making so that it feels as immersive as possible. After the show, I'm gonna have to uh, get a reference to that videographer. But um, <laughs> so now that you have uh, good content on your Patreon, how do you like, do? How do you work the funnel like that you were talking about earlier? How do you get people from the other sites to actually make the step to the Patreon and donate the dollar or more? Awesome. So uh, this is like the big question, right? How do we get people <laughs> to actually do the thing? And I s have seen before frustration expressed from artists who just uh, are for they're very really frustrated about the search function in patreon not working very well and to me and they're just like they just want people to go on to patreon like type in art and they want you to pop up and then they're going to be like oh i'll pledge to that that's not how Patreon works. It's much more personal. So when I hear people say that, it makes me think of someone going on to PayPal, typing in a random email address and being like, I'm going to give this person $5. Mm -hmm. Like nobody does that with PayPal. Nobody does that with Patreon. You really have to, it's a relationship that you build over time. Sometimes that can be a very short interaction, like at a convention of, uh, and that was primarily how I was doing it, to be honest. Um, the longer way is to do it on social media. And they have to kind of see you again and again and again. Um, so primarily how I would do this uh, before was at conventions. We don't have conventions right now. Uh, so I hope you don't mind if I talk about it a little bit, because that was the most effective way for me. No, please do talk about it, because I imagine at some point they'll come back in, in some way and or online conventions will become more of the norm and so i would only say like in talking about your past convention experience if you have any thoughts looking forward to the possibility that the online convention will be more the standard what are your thoughts about that continuing forward definitely okay so when i was um when we did have conventions i would do a usually a con every month or a couple months that I skipped 
but um, in general, I had maybe like eight or nine or 10 shows a year. And every show I could guarantee that I would get anywhere between like five to 20 patrons, uh, depending on, excuse me, how the show went, the attendance, how on I was, like all of those things. So uh, how I do it at a show is I have, oh man, I should have grabbed one. I have like a little gift bag that I have and it's not very expensive. It's just a postcard that says, welcome to Teratoff. It's got a couple stickers in it and it might have like a magnet or um, a button, something that like I've pre-ordered a while ago in bulk that has my art in it. And I let them know, hey, uh, you can get this like welcome to Teratoff Patreon pack if you pledge just a dollar. And if they pledge, then there's other stuff that I put in it. But I always handle that discussion very delicately because if someone just comes to your booth and you just spring on them, like, oh, well, I have a Patreon, then that can be like a little Turn off. overwhelming and it can come off salesy. Right. Um, one thing that sometimes happens at my booth that would happen at Disney World is like you get the one picket guy. So um, when I worked at Disney World, we had like this whole spiel that we had to go through. And it was because uh, the tickets change a lot. They actually change a lot more now from when I worked there. Like now the price changes every day. So I cannot imagine what those vacation planners are going through. But um, you, you would have to like go through this whole spiel because a lot of people just aren't educated on how the ticket system works. So they might come every day thinking that they have to buy a one day ticket where you could be like, Hey, if you're going to come for three days, you can get a three day ticket and save like $50 a person. Would you rather do that? And they'd be like, Oh yeah, I'd love to do that. But every now, like a couple an hour, you get just like one ticket one day. You just have that guy. That's just like, that's all they want. It's really short and sweet. You don't do anything else. You just give them their one ticket and they go. And mm -hmm. there are a couple pieces of art that I know that when they uh, approach me and they have that kind of aura around them, <laughs> that they're just like a one ticket guy. They just want that one piece and that's it. They're going to move on. They don't really care about who I am or what the stuff is. They just think that thing is cool and they want to put it on their wall. I'll sell them art, but I'm not going to go into my whole Patreon spiel with them because I know they're just a one ticket guy. They're not going to come back and buy more stuff. They're not really invested in me as a creator. They just think that this one thing I did was cool and they think it'd be a great gift for somebody or they want to stick it on their wall or whatever. Um, so what I do is I pay a lot of attention to body language and social cues and just like talking points. And I've actually listened to some audio, some great audiobooks about body language. And I recommend that anybody that does conventions uh, invest a little bit of your time in researching body language because it can be really illuminating and help you to just understand um, the interactions that you're having with people. And um, it can help you do things like figure out, is this person like really interested in my art or are they just being polite or should this conversation end? Like being able <laughs> to understand some things about body language can really help with that. Um, so I pay attention to those things. And when people say things like, I just love this. I, I think this is so great. I love the stories on it. I think, oh my God, are you going to make a book? This would make a great book. You should make a book about this. Are you going to do a tarot card deck? Oh, this would make great tarot card decks. If they start getting like really excited that they're asking like, what's the next thing? Then I know that they are really interested in the next thing. So that's when I'll bring up like, hey, thanks for loving my art so much and being so interested in it. By the way, um, I have a Patreon where I post uh, new art and stories regularly. You can follow for free and you can see all of the art and final stories that I make. But if you pledge even just a dollar a month, it'll really help me to make more of this art faster. And mm -hmm. you can get to see more of the art before other people get to see it. So I'm not just like looking to make a sale. I'm looking to give somebody the entertainment that they want. Like they are telling me, I like this thing. It entertains me. I want it in my life more. And I'm telling them, well, you can have more and this is how you can get it. So I think when you approach with that kind of state of mind, it comes off much more like genuine and not so like 
salesy, like those annoying people in the mall that are just like, let me braid your hair. Like, no, leave yeah. me alone. Spraying perfume no. at you. What? What? Why don't you want it? I can't relate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? What do you mean? Not- I saw your perfume collection, dude. That's You don't got to lie. Um, I see this collection now. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry well no i i don't mean to interrupt your flow on on conventions um it, it, I, maybe you still had some more to say about that or again like what you were you know if, if you had any thoughts in mind about looking towards the future about online yeah. conventions so that's the thing right covid's a thing mm-hmm. and as a result we're not doing any in-person shows right now And I'm not going to lie, it has affected my Patreon growth. I've actually, I was doing, I was, I was like right on track to hit like my next benchmark. I Mm. could taste it. I was like, I'm I'm like right there at 200. Just need to do a couple more shows and I'll get there. And then overnight, it was like the Renaissance Fair shut down. And all of the shows were emailing us saying, got some bad news like a rescheduling or please don't ask us to give a your you are uh, your money back you know like everything just stopped overnight and it hit me hard because that was like my main way of getting the shows because uh, I don't know if you've noticed this about me but I really like to talk and I feel like I'm pretty good at talking to people so Indeed. I'm <laughs> So I actually don't think that I have the best online presence right now. Like I have less than 10,000 Instagram followers and um, I'm just starting to dip my toe into TikTok and uh, Discord and things like that. So I am way, way better in person than I am online. So suddenly uh, my main way of like recruiting new Teratophians has been derailed and like month by month, like the membership is slowly uh, tapering down and I totally understand it because these are unprecedented times. Funny enough, even though I'm losing patrons numerically, the dollar amount has stayed pretty much the same because other people are pledging up because mm-hmm. they know I'm struggling and they want to like help out or because they um, just really believe in the idea and they want more of it. So thankfully, I love all my patrons. They have been really amazing. And without shows, I don't know what the heck I would do without them right now. So how do we move on from uh, relying on shows to grow our Patreon audience? Well, to be honest, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I have a plan. Okay, so here is my plan. I'm starting to focus more um, down the avenues of YouTube and Kickstarter. Uh, YouTube, because that is the closest thing I can get to, to being in person with somebody. So it's all about like knowing what your strengths are and trying to utilize those things. I know other artists that are fantastic at Instagram and they have a huge following there and they can mobilize that. Uh, for me, it's like, I gotta be in person talking to you, showing you this thing. So you can kind of like see what it is. Pat and I have talked about in the past, like having my booth at other conventions and having somebody else man it for me. And Tad has always shot the idea down because he's like, without you, it's just not Teratov. Like it just won't do as good if you're not there. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, we've seen that happen at shows where like, I have to go do a panel or I take a break or whatever. It's just, it's, it's, it's just not the same. Um, So how do I get my face out there? That's why I've been looking more into YouTube. Um, I'm not going to lie. Venturing into video is hard. And I have a background like in video production and animation. (laughs) It takes a lot of time and dedication to be able to start something like that. But I'm really dedicating myself to it. I'm trying to put out a video every week. And I'm doing things in my daily schedule to make that as easy as possible. So I spent about a month or so on my off time preparing assets and um, sequences in uh, Adobe Premiere and in After Effects. So for those of you who 
case you don't know anything about Adobe After Effects or Premiere, basically what I was doing was I was setting up the skeleton of my videos and getting things ready, like uh, how I want text to come in, how I want to transition from one piece of footage to the next piece of footage, how I want my logo to come in, how I want the credits to scroll by. These are all things that you can pre-make and uh, After Effects, which is more for making graphics and Adobe Premiere, which is best used for editing footage. They work really well together so that you can have a bunch of stuff pre-made that you can edit on the go. So I made sure to have all of that kind of stuff prepared at first. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing is I've been returning to Twitch doing something that I call quiet cam. So I've been recording my art every day for about two years now, but I wasn't broadcasting it because I previously was on Twitch for a long time and I would um, be on camera and making art. Well, it turns out that when I'm making art, that's like the one time that I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's like when introvert Heather freaks her head. So I realized that um, after many, I, I tried, I mean, you were there. I was doing the Twitch thing for about two years, being on camera and making art at the same time. I found it was really difficult and I had to have one of those conversations with myself again. Do I really like doing this? Do I really like, no, no, I don't. And I wish I did. I really wish I did like it. Um, but I feel like I suffer with my interaction with the audience and also the art suffers because I'm just not able to focus on both things. When I have someone in the room, I want my focus to be solely on them. If I'm talking to them, when I'm making my art, I want to be completely immersed in that experience and imagining myself standing there with this unicorn that I'm drawing or this other creature or going through the story in my head so I can kind of emotionally impart what I'm going through onto that piece. So now I do a uh, quiet cam where it's just the art. I don't talk. Uh, I will react to the chat with my hands and the art is live. And what that has allowed me to do is I can take those videos later and turn them into my time-lapse videos for YouTube. Or I can turn them into my story time videos where I will record myself separately like reading the story aloud and giving them like a cute little intro thing. And then like I'll record bloopers as well and like make a whole like little production of it. So uh, I've also made a very rigorous schedule to be able to accomplish this. So Monday through Thursday is all quiet cam day. So those are all the days that I'm really focused on making art and working on the stories Friday is the day that I usually do my one video chat that I do a, a week, and that's when I have pre-recorded art playing. Um, I actually did not do it this week because I'm doing this with you today. <laughs> and I will only do my makeup one day a week. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually, I recorded my uh, Patreon secret story time video where I do like a monthly wrap up of what I do, uh, what I did that month. And I made the joke, I have to like, ration my makeup out so i'm only doing <laughs> the one video chat with jovi in a few hours <laughs> <laughs> i like it I feel so honored and then um saturday will be the day that i do all my editing to try to like get all the videos done mm -hmm. sometimes right now it also goes into sunday because i'm still like getting used to doing this regularly and it's a lot of work but i really do see the potential in youtube just like i did with patreon it's like a small like little trickle that I think is going to eventually become like, it has the potential to become a waterfall. Mm -hmm. um, back when I did videos with uh, other channels and I was doing um, TV work, I heard a lot that I was good on video. I don't know how I feel about it, but if other people say I'm really good on video, then I'm going to try and go ahead and do that. So um, it does suck that it cuts into my art making time, but I'm looking at it as like an investment into my future because the one advantage that I do have with video over being at a show is that YouTube video is evergreen content. So mm -hmm. somebody might find that video in like six months and be like, oh, well, this is really great. I 
I'm going to go watch the rest of her videos. And maybe in six months, I'll have like, you know, hopefully like 10 or 20 more videos that they can watch. And it becomes like a binge thing. We all know how people love to binge things yeah. right now. Yeah. So instead of that performance being like a moment that's come and gone, that doesn't exist anymore with a video, it's around forever. And kind of like, I think we were talking off camera a little bit about Pinterest and how mm -hmm. like that grows over time. Yeah. Um, my research on YouTube says that it's the same thing. Like it just grows and grows and grows. So now I'm utilizing, I'm working on utilizing YouTube as a way to funnel people to my Patreon. Hopefully they'll fall in love with me. They'll fall in love with the art and they'll want to support it. I know personally that there are several YouTubers that I'm really passionate about, like um, Caitlin Doty from The Good Death. She does a, yeah. a YouTube about Ask a Mortician. <laughs> and I became her patron because I loved her YouTube channel and I wanted to see more content about dead bodies. So I was <laughs> like, yeah, I know. So we can always think about these things like, what do I buy? What do I, how do I consume content? How do I get this thing? And we can use that as like a tipping off point of like how to continue on from there. There's another thing that I was doing besides YouTube. What was it? I said at the beginning, but now I don't remember. Oh, yes. Kickstarters. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kickstarter. Uh, I've done one before. I wish I had done more. But doing Kickstarter is actually a really great way to grow your audience. Uh, Kickstarter is a place where people will just browse for things to buy or they will just like browse for things to discover. It's a great discovery platform. Whereas Patreon is not a discovery platform. That's not where people are going to browse to come find you, but they will browse Kickstarter and try to find something that just grabs their interest. So I'm going to, I actually have three Kickstarters planned over the next like year or so. And mm -hmm. I'm, and they're all wildly different projects. One is going to be my holiday pin Kickstarter that starts in a um, little bit more than a week. My story, nope. I originally had it scheduled for November 4th. And I was like, November 4th, November 4th. Why, why is that date significant? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of my subconscious then, doesn't want to think about it, but it's reminding oh. me nonetheless. Of the, for our listeners that are international, that is the day after the U.S. presidential election. So I was like, that's probably not going to be a day that people are going to give a crap about a new Kickstarter. Right. No matter what the results are. So I was like, okay, like I need to move this. So now it's tentatively going to launch on the 10th. And it's um, uh, two holiday pins. One is one of my unicorn characters. And uh, the other one is a stag, and they're both based on my favorite holiday stories. Um, the unicorn is called Sugar Plum, and she's inspired by the Sugar Plum Fairy. And then we have Marley the Stag, who is inspired by the ghost of Jacob Marley from A Christmas Carol. And when my Kickstarter comes out, go and check out that video. And I talk a little bit more about those stories and why I love them. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a Kickstarter plan for my first book, which will be a unicorn book filled with all my unicorn art and stories. That's going to happen tentatively in June next year. And then I have a secret Kickstarter that's going to happen like in the early spring that I haven't told anyone about yet. So I'm keeping oh. it secret right now. Wow. Teaser. They're all yeah. like, very different projects so that I can hit different markets, you know, get different okay. people that are interested in different things. Like one person might not care about a book, but they really love pins. They like collect them and they okay. want to have more pins. And then maybe someone doesn't care about pins. They think they're kind of worthless. Like why do people collect these things? But they love books. They love to read books. So I'm going to try lots of different things and kind of just see what sticks. That's kind of the exciting thing about these times. It's the perfect excuse to try different things and evolve and maybe we'll find things that work better than conventions and we'll find something that um is more sustainable than having to prepare and go to a show every month like mm -hmm. i would be really happy if i could get my youtube to a place where i am able to just like do a video like once a month and it's still thriving mm -hmm. um I'm actually working with a video editor as well to kind of help me um, 
accelerate my video output right now. So I'm editing some videos and he's editing some videos as well so that I can try to get as much content on there as possible, as quickly as possible. Mm. So Interesting. to answer your question, since I don't have conventions, I'm trying out some Kickstarter stuff and some YouTube stuff and I'll let you know how it goes. So far, the YouTube is promising. Like it's kind of like Patreon at first. Like I'm only getting a few little comments, a few little likes. But those little comments and little likes mean everything to me. And they are comments from people that I don't recognize. So that means that there's like other people finding me there that haven't found me before. Every couple of days, I get a few more subscriptions to it. So I'm like, it's it's growing. It's it's like these little plants. These little <laughs> plants, they start out real small. Then they get really big. And then you propagate them and make more plants. And... This is my quarantine hobby, by the way. And it's actually taught me a lot about um, how things can like grow from small beginnings. So hey, don't fair forget. Enough. Yeah, Start I, small beginnings. I, I feel like it'd be really interesting to have you on again some months in the future to revisit all of this stuff and kind of see what has happened in the interim, lessons you've learned advice you would give all that kind of stuff um and i don't want to go down the youtube rabbit hole too much farther but I do i can't resist the uh the immediate question that popped in my head which is like okay you're doing the youtube thing now uh in order to sort of funnel to the patreon but then <laughs> is there something that you're doing to funnel people towards your youtube <laughs> how does that how does that happen <laughs> funnels all the way down man I'm still figuring that one out. So there's two things that I'm doing. Uh, one, whenever I have a new video that's live, I share it everywhere. I uh, make a separate render of a shortened clip of the video and share it on my social media. Mm. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do these videos so that people will actually see them because there are certain like tricks to video to make them more appealing to watch and make people like actually stop and watch it which will help the algorithm in your favor so i'm experimenting with things like should i try more text should i try less text should i try speeding up this video should i try slowing it down so i'm kind of experimenting with what works a little bit with that mm -hmm. the other thing that um i did to kind of prepare for this was i actually talked to somebody that i know that's like really good with youtube and he gave me a lot of really good advice on seo and the kind of keywords and tags that i should use i found out i was doing tags all wrong oh really <laughs> yeah that's so doing like that kind of research to like be able to utilize the search engine for YouTube. So when people go looking for your stuff, they can actually find it, I think is key. Maybe so, uh, oh, I, I was just going to say maybe after the, the podcast at some point, we can talk a little bit more about that because I'm <laughs> so curious. I have so many more questions, but anyway, go ahead. Moose. Yeah. So I don't know a whole lot about uh, YouTube uh, It's not as much as any other. I know more about other social medias than I do about YouTube, but there's one thing I do know. And that is, uh, in order to please the algorithm, you have to split up a big video into multiple small ones and then have those small ones link back to the big one. And that's like a super crack to the uh, the algorithm. If someone watches one of your smaller videos and then they click the link to go to the next video, that's the larger one. So if you... I've never actually heard that before. So if you have a, uh, a video that's like the top 10 things that artists need to know in 2020 and then you turn those 10 into individual ones with their uh each their own title for oh okay so that somebody i see what you're talking somebody about. looks up oh uh, what's the best type of pencil to use in 2020 they find that video and then they're like oh this video links to the other things you need to know in 2020 i wonder if if that would also work for two hour long podcasts <laughs> part yeah one i was gonna two. mention that to you but... <laughs> okay we'll, we'll talk about that uh some more because i i do want to get back to the uh um teratoff and Teratoff on Patreon. Um, one of the things that's really inviting and intriguing about Teratoff on Patreon is uh, and something that you mentioned earlier, this, I, this big picture thing. There's a uh, evolving, an, an overarching, ever-evolving story arc. And that's really exciting because you're getting to see something 
um, come to life before your your eyes and you don't know what the ultimate outcome will be and the viewers feel sort of like part of that with you because you have an idea maybe of where it's going but you're also probably surprised by some things right so then there's this like you know sort of reciprocity thing um that like you know like one of the things that's always sort of disappointing about video games is like you beat the game and then it's like well all you can do is like play the same video game again and you get the same story this is like you get right you get all of the like (laughs) jasm ups of a video game but it's like you'll never come back to the same story you know it's like always it's always new but then like they're (laughs) there but then there you know there may be artists that are listening to this we're like "Mm, well i don't have a big storyline you know it's um you feel that that is necessarily a ding against an artist that doesn't have like a, you know, some larger grandiose epic that they're developing. And if not, what would you say to somebody that, you know, doesn't have that or doesn't have that yet? What are some lessons that they could still take away from this to give that same kind of like, you know, invitation to people? Oh yeah. Well, I think it really depends depends on the kind of creator that you are. And for me, I just love long epic tales and I love storytelling in so many different forms. Like I love short story. I love like long, like episodic things that go on and on and on. Like I love it all. And then there are other creators that I know that they just love making art and the story is more like a feeling that they have. There isn't like a beginning, middle and end. It's more you're telling the story of your emotional state at the time that you were making it. And both are completely valid. They're some of the biggest Patreons I know um, from artists. They, as far as I know, there's no overarching story or anything like that. They're just individual pieces that, belong in the world that the artist is creating like in their collection of work but they're not necessarily building a world and considering things like how does currency work in this world what would the map look like what kind of government is there like they're not necessarily answering those questions they're just kind of leaving it open-ended for the viewer to decide. I think Annie Stegg is a really great example of a Patreon that you can look at that doesn't necessarily have like a big overarching story as far as I know, um, that is wildly popular and thriving and doing extremely well. And then you have other people like Emily Hare, who is doing her uh, Strange Hollow World where she does have more overarching stories and things that um, connect all of the characters together in a more traditional storytelling type of fashion. And Iris Compete has her uh, Fairies of the Fault lines. So some artists, like, they don't have a big story and some artists do. It just depends on the kind of creator that you are and the kind of art that you make. Now, if you are somebody that would like to get into having a big overarching story and that's something that you want to explore, um, my advice would be to consume stories. Consume them as much as you can in every way that you can. Like I make time to watch TV. I make time to binge my favorite series on Netflix. I uh, play video games. Actually, some of my favorite storytelling is through video games. And I really think that it is like just a revolutionary media. And I would love to do a Teratoff video game one Mm. day. I actually kind of fantasize about some of the game mechanics that I would put in. And actually thinking about the story in terms of a video game can help me problem solve some of the uh, story uh, things that I'm going through. So let me give you an example. Actually, I was thinking about this. I was like jotting down ideas wildly before we actually started this podcast. So (laughs) um, the villains, the baddies in my world of Teratov are these creatures called the Rot. And they are corrupted by a plague that corrupts them from the inside out. So what that means is first their personality changes uh, to be an evil, corrupted version of their former self. 
And then their body changes as a reflection of the inner torment inside. So something about how their body changes is a visual representation of how their personality has changed. So for example, um, on my Instagram right now, there is a piece of a fawn who has these antlers coming out of her eyeballs. And the reason why she transformed that way is a representation of her vanity uh, in the story. So what was the point I was getting at? Storytelling. Da, da, da. Oh, no, I got completely derailed. Where was I going? Video games. <laughs> You were, you were tying uh, your future ideas for video games into the yeah. story building. So I was thinking about, well, how would you defeat a creature like this, like in battle? Because the idea behind these creatures is they're kind of like their former selves are dead. So they behave in very ghost-like fashion. Like they can teleport from place to place. They're uh, very good at creating illusions and they don't need to eat or sleep. Like they are basically like a ghost that is still kind of in a body. So how would you defeat a, a creature like this? And like, it's been racking my brain for months because I'm at that point where like, I need to think about like, how would you actually kill a creature like this? And thinking about it in terms of a video game actually helped me piece together. Like, okay, well you would need to be able to, not have this creature creep up on you. What are some things that I can work into the story that actually makes sense? So part of the lore is um, if you, and it's kind of based on demonology loosely, uh, if you know like uh, a demon or spirit's name that you can have some control over it. And it's the same way in my story of Teratov. But I wanted to dive deeper into that. It was like, okay, well, that seems like a kind of easy, like, kind of not a, like there should be more to this solution. So in thinking about it, like a video game helped me kind of brainstorm and come up with other things that I could do. So um, keep consuming all of these different stories, whatever it is that you like to do. I also read a lot now. I admittedly did not read a whole lot in the past. And um, now that I'm really like diving into making books and wanting to get better at writing, I've made a commitment to read. So I have three books that I usually read at a time. Uh, in the morning, uh, while I'm walking, I listen to an audio book that's something about like self-motivation or wellness. Mm -hmm. So it's something to kind of like get me, it's something in my personal life that I can utilize to just kind of make me um, a more well-rounded individual as a human. And then during quiet cam, I'm actually listening to an audiobook that is a novel of some sort. So that's kind of like my fun listening time. And then at night, I actually have physical books where I look at and I uh, read about something to do with my business. So right now I'm reading a book that my accountant wrote about business structure, which is really riveting, but it's stuff that I have to know. <laughs> so, um consuming myself in all of these stories um, is actually like so important. And I think that, you know, we get so focused as creators, just like making the thing. We forget that like, we have to fill our cup too. Like we have to fill our mm -hmm. cup with inspiration and ideas and things that we love. So we can like make a thing that other people love too. And I found that like when I don't take time to read or to play a video game or to read a book, when I am making art, it's just like autopilot. It's just, I'm just going to draw this unicorn because <laughs> there's a bunny and it's here. It's a cute bunny, but there's really nothing else to it. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, so. yeah, it's what I've heard described as, um, before things or, or no, stuff on display <laughs> yes! where, it's, where it's basically it's a still life. It. You've just, you've put a feather with a skull next to some grapes. Looks beautiful. <laughs> totally boring. Anyway. Um, no idea. <laughs> it, let's talk about tears for a little bit. Patreon is something okay. that um, invites subscribers to participate in via different levels of contribution called tiers. Um, and at each tier represents some type of reward or level of participation in the project. Um, and there's all sorts of things that you can offer 
in the way of these rewards to people. Um, And that can be a sticky point for a lot of people. Uh, Mm -hmm. They get, they start getting gun shy about committing. Well, a couple of things will happen. They, they get gun shy about committing to things that they're going to deliver as rewards. Um, And they get over exuberant about how much they're going to offer and what they're going to offer. (laughs) Yes, me too. (laughs) Um, So, are how much flex one? Let me kind of like ask two questions in one. How much flexibility is there in terms of adjusting later on the fly? Um, and what are some ideas you have for not over committing and kind of overwhelming yourself in terms of what you are going to offer? That's a great question because it's something I've been like really struggling with, with the past couple of months, um, I realized that. So one of the things, another like habit that I've instilled in myself this year is I keep a journal of everything I do every day. I'm a big dork secretly. <laughs> so sounds, sounds um, smart to me. Been, I mean, I think it's smart, but I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but it's been very illuminating because in keeping this journal, like I realized like where I'm actually spending my time because we all have an idea in our head of where we're spending our time, but our minds are cruel and deceitful and they don't really, it's not the same thing as actually like looking at a list of all the things and how many hours you put into those things and facing the reality. Mm -hmm. And my reality this year was because I didn't have shows and I didn't have any other public events, I basically was just at home making art all the time. Uh, With the exception of the month that we moved, um, I've just been making art. And I realized that I was spending so much of my time making the Patreon mail-in rewards. And that's why I had not done a single painting bigger than a five by seven this year. And that's just not gonna fly Hmm. because, while like small pieces are great, like I cannot keep making 48, a uh, two and a half by three and a half paintings a year. It's just not going to grow tarot off in the direction that I want to go because I need bigger art to put in the books. I need bigger arts that I can uh, make prints out of. And I need bigger art just to kind of like wow people and to tell the story that I want to tell them because I cannot tell a story on a canvas this big. I can make a cute little flower and it's really nice and it's really pretty, but this tells a story. Right. That's what I'm in the business of. I'm in the business of entertainment and telling stories. So I had to take a really hard look at that and I'm actually implementing some changes to my Patreon soon to allow me to make more paintings like that because I've kind of felt like for a while now I've been a little disconnected from telling the stories in the way that I want to do that and making so much small art has taken away from that so I want to get back to that goal and while the thought that I might lose some patrons that like that little art I know that um, it's all going to be worthwhile in the end because I'm going to get to make the art that I need to make and I want to make to communicate this story and this realm in the way that I want to. And at the end of the day, that's why Patreon is there. It's not so I can fulfill a whole bunch of small pre-orders for things. Mm -hmm. So how do I implement the change? Well, I've done it before and I'm doing it again. The first time I did it, I actually wanted to increase the price of the ACOs because at first they were just quick little sketches. And then I found myself in that trap of, I can't sell this thing that I don't think is awesome. So I have to make them better. So I started spending more and more time on them. And so I wanted to increase the price. So the one thing that you cannot change on a tier is the price once it's actually got people pledged to it. Mm. So I had to make a new tier and I had to communicate to my patrons if they wanted to continue to get that reward they had to move on to this other tier. Mm. That was a little bit of a uphill battle because um, a lot of people don't check Patreon regularly. They're just happy to give you uh, their money and wait for the thing to arrive 
So trying to get a hold of them was a little tricky and trying to like communicate the idea to them was a little tricky. So I did lose some patrons uh, from that tier. They either downgraded or they decided to uh, like leave the theater for now. Um, but I did uh, fill those spots eventually. This time I'm not gonna change to have them go to a new tier. I'm gonna keep the same tier and just change the reward. Now here's my advice if you want to change your tiers. It's a great thing to do on Patreon, actually, because a lot of these people are going to be pledged to you for years and it can get stale seeing the same thing over mm -hmm. and over again, getting the same thing over and over again. That's why our favorite TV shows, they'll like add a new character out of nowhere that suddenly becomes like a headliner to the show or they'll kill someone off. Or like, that's why every couple of years we've got a new doctor on Doctor Who and Doctor Who's been around for <laughs> an eternity. <laughs> These things actually work, love them or hate them. Like it keeps it fresh. It keeps it from not being boring. I mean, how many shows have you watched that you're like, that should have ended four seasons ago? Yeah. You know? <clears throat> Lost. You <don't> <clears throat> <that>. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> you don't want that be your patreon so actually changing the tiers is a good thing now i think that there are some guidelines that we should keep in mind while we do it one you shouldn't change them too often i think that the most you should probably change them is every ideally i would say once a year um if you have to because you accidentally commit to something that you realize is just not going to work i think you can make it work with six months but not if you're going to do it every six months, maybe like you do one in a year and then six months after that. And then a year after that mm. kind of thing. The other thing that I recommend doing, especially if it's a mail in tier where you are mailing a reward to your patrons, you give them several months of notice. Mm -hmm. um, why should you do that? One, because they have been faithfully supporting your art for however many months and, um, you know, you should not just spring on them before they've had the chance to consider whether or not they want to remain in that tier, that something's going to change. You know, this is a more intimate kind of interaction. It's a more intimate platform. It's OK to communicate with your patrons one on one. In fact, I encourage it. The other thing that I recommend is that you um, explain it several times and reiterate it because like I can't tell you how many times I when I had changed the tiers the first time that even like when it happened I had people asking me what happened like, I've been talking mm -hmm. about this for months so you gotta mm -hmm. like repeat it um actually at one point I because they are my mail-in tiers I actually sent them a letter with their last reward at that tier explaining to them this tier is going to close if you want to keep getting this reward please change to this tier so um communicate with your patrons clearly give them time to do it and um when you explain it explain it in a way that and do the change with the heart that it's going to be a benefit to you and to them. Because if you come at it like I'm taking your reward away, well, uh -huh. that, doesn't, that doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound nice. Um, when the time comes, and I've already pre-scheduled a post for my patrons to explain the upcoming change, like speak to them from your heart. Like I've let them know, like honestly, like, you know, I'm making 48 ACOs a year and those are great, but they do not communicate a story. And we are here to make a world of art and stories. So if we are all working towards that goal, then this is what we have to do. I'm also giving them a reward. I plan to give them a reward anyway. I'm still working out to make sure that it'll work. It's something that many people have asked me for. It's something that would definitely fit into the world of Teratov, and it's something that I can do batch. So I can do a whole bunch of these things ahead of time and just mail them out when the time comes. I don't have to worry about making new stuff every month. Like this, the thing is already ready to go and it's gonna go out. Give you guys a little hint. It involves storytelling with a picture that you read in your hands. So it's a taco. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're gonna mail me a taco? This is I oh, fucking sign me up. <laughs> I mean, it's the best Patreon idea ever, right? I'm so in. <laughs> is that yeah, th so, so? That's that's all we get is a little hint. All right. That's all you get. I have okay. to tell my patrons first. Before I tell everybody of course, else. of course. I just hope that they like it. Um, and I'm gonna do. I'm really excited about it because the concept. I'm actually working on like a whole new story to uh, introduce this new uh, item that I'm creating to the world. So it's not just gonna be like here's a thing that I put on a thing for you. It's actually like gonna be a part of the world. And I was actually inspired by David Peterson for this. He does um, the story of Mouse Guard, and He's created a world about these little like night mice that are like um, fighting like the nature natural elements. And there's a board game in his story that pops up again and again. And I think he actually made the game or he's working on making the game or like fans have made their versions of it. I actually can't remember exactly what it was, but I, I remember. So. Huh? I believe it's out. Yeah. It is out? Okay. I was like, wait, did I accidentally reveal, like, NDA stuff? Oops. Okay. But <laughs> um, but that idea, like, really inspired this concept for this new thing that I'm going to try with my patrons, that, like, there could be a game that is a part of your world that makes sense to the world that these characters live in that your patrons can have and collect as well. A um, quick aside, uh, I wanted to go way back in time in the chat just for a sec, because uh, Sosa Demonis in the chat um, said a while ago, in taking advice on become a patron to get used to the site, Heather has a new patron. So <gasps> there you go. Thank you. Yay. Thank Welcome you so to Teratop. You're officially a Teratopian now. That's awesome. super rad. Um, yeah. So, um, in, Spending just a little bit more time on that idea of uh, like your initial output. Um, do you have any tips or takeaways for people just starting a, a Patreon? You know, like what what are some ways that they can set themselves up as far as rewards for tiers to not overwhelm themselves? You know, what be it like? Don't offer. You mentioned something before about getting advice. Like, don't have mail ins. You know, like what kind of, what kind of, th what kind of things would you tell somebody? Right. So, okay. Like the easy thing to say, uh, and I kind of said it like, you know, I said it, but there's like a, an asterisk there. So if you can help it, don't have mail-in rewards. If you are a big enough artist and you already have a big enough following that you can get people to your Patreon without the enticement of a physical mail-in reward, you should do that. Mm. However, many of us are not quite at that uh, space yet. So I feel that having at least one physical item as like the hallmark of your tiers, like this is the shining trophy tier, is impressive. And it entices people to um, explore pledging more so that they can get that reward or it at least offers the benefit of um what's that term price bracketing or price framing is that it price framing where you have your highest tier that you don't necessarily want people to pledge to or you don't expect them to pledge to it's just there to make your other tiers look more reasonable and affordable so mm. like for example if you're most expensive tier is $25, then $25 sounds expensive. Mm. Um, and your $5 and your $1 tier seem to be a reasonable price. My highest tier is $175. <laughs> so $25 next to $175, well, that's just a bargain. You're like, you're mm. losing money if you don't punch to that one. Psychology. So it, it, yeah, it is there. You do have like a little bit of the psychological stuff that goes into it, which can feel a little bit yucky, but like we are running a business. Like we do have to consider these things. And as long as you're offering quality and you're offering, um, you know, a piece that you're excited about, then I don't feel bad about it at all. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's um, Yeah. 
And you should also research um, what kind of tiers and how many tiers are specific to your industry. So for a little while, we were kicking around the idea of my husband, Tad, starting his own Patreon, and he primarily focuses on comic book work. Um, we're still exploring that. But the reason why we're still exploring it is because the way that comic book Kickstarter uh, Patreons operate versus more illustrative focused ones like mine are completely different. Like many of the illustrative ones, they have like, you know, uh, between like six or 10 tiers where they offer a variety of things and you can get some like really great stuff like original art. Whereas with the comic book people, quite often it was just one tier. It was just the $1 tier or pay what you want, or they had a $1 and a $3. Like they keep it very simple. So research the kind of tiers that are common in your industry, because chances are if you're getting patrons um, that most of them have been pledged to something else. So they're going to have an expectation of the kind of tiers that they're going to see on your Patreon. And um, you want to kind of be in alignment with what other people are offering so you don't confuse them. But also don't be afraid to tweak the formula a little bit so that you can stand out. And for me, that's what like the mail-in tier, tier offers. Because I do traditional art and it's not digital art, I feel that it's important to offer some sort of physical thing at a certain price point, right? And ultimately, I would love to do an enamel pin tier like Annie Stegg does. Um, however, that requires a lot of capital to do it up front, and I just don't have that. So I'm getting creative and trying other things. Um, but I recommend to avoid accidentally doing what I did and committing to more than you might be able to actually keep up with month after month. Start mm -hmm. with what you know you can do, like do like a $1 thank you tier and you get access to my stuff. Do a $5 coloring page download and a desktop background, like easy stuff that's just deliverable by email. You can always add more tiers later. I was kind of in the position where I needed to hit the ground running hard and I wanted it to take off fast. So I went ahead and I added like all of these really extravagant tiers right off the bat and they've evolved over time. I've changed them. Um, but I do think that it might have been better for my sanity to offer less mail-in stuff and kind of gradually bring them in as I knew what I could actually accomplish every month. Um, you might not get the highest number of pledges or the biggest dollar amounts, but you'll know that you can manage it. And I think that uh, ultimately that is in the long run uh, better. And like I said before, you can always add more tiers, you can edit your tiers, and that just makes the journey of being a patron more exciting. Um, there's this thing that I've heard before in sales where people already, uh, they take something like, I think it's between five and 20 seconds to decide if they want to buy from you, and then they spend the rest of the time deciding what they want. And I think that applies to Patreon too. I think people have already decided they want to pledge. They just have to make the choice of what tier they want. So I think that it would be really difficult to make a tier that would have someone have the reaction of they've come to your Patreon to pledge and then they see your tier and they're like, oh, actually, no, I don't want to. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not going to do this today, actually. I, these mm -hmm. tiers are rubbish. No. So if you have too many tiers, maybe people will get uh, analysis paralysis and choose to decide later, and then they forgot to come back to uh, to pledge at all. Yeah, I think that's actually happened to me. So that's a thing. Yeah. I um, only have like 10 tiers. How many tiers do you have? I have 10, I think. I have to go back and count, but I think it's around 10. Wow, that seems like a lot. I have... I have three and I'm like, ah, uh, it's so much. <laughs> but I imagine like a lot of that is just kind of getting used to the process. I, I came out guns blazing with the Patreon a while ago and same mistake, overdid it, overwhelmed myself. It just 
it was too crazy. And then I just like scaled it way back, kind of stopped paying attention to it for a while. And now I'm taking the good advice that you've been giving us so far is like, okay, let's, let's start off slow and, and, uh, and gradually build it up. Moose, you mentioned, I think off before we got started, a question that you, that you wanted to ask as far as like a dis, an uncomfortability that people right. have. Yeah. So you even mentioned it with the, um, the feeling yucky bit and i have some friends who uh well i talk to a lot of different artists and what one artist finds totally okay with one other one will have a problem with and so i even know somebody who has a problem with asking their friends at all to join their patreon thinking that they don't they're feeling like they're taking advantage of their friends uh do you have any thoughts as to like how to get over such feelings oh wow that's such a big question because it really like depends on your relationship with the individual and how you view your friendships. Like I have no problem asking my friends for help. I probably ask for their help too much. <laughs> so, um, I would be like really missing out if I was afraid to even ask. Um, and so I, I sympathize with where that person's coming from because like, I really do like love and appreciate my friends and all they do for me. And I would be like, be really sad if they weren't around to like be my friend or help me. Um, I guess what I would say is, you know, put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself if my friend asked me to do this, would I be uncomfortable with it? And there are times where like I've put myself in that position and I've decided uh, not with Patreon necessarily, but like just with other things in life. And I'm like, yeah, I would be uncomfortable. Like, for example, when we moved in August in Florida, where it's incredibly hot, I had people like offer to help us move or the question came up, should we ask people to help us move? And we decided like, I'm just not comfortable with that given like the circumstances of what's going on right now. Like even if like my best friend asked me to help them move, I would feel really uncomfortable like helping anybody move right now because of everything that's going on like maybe i could help some way from afar but i would have a really hard time like showing up so um i think like ask yourself am i comfortable with this if it was me and i think oftentimes if we're really honest with ourselves the answer is yeah that actually doesn't bother me and if my friend came to me and said this is my dream. I'm working really hard on it. It would really mean a lot to me if you could help with this thing. And personally, I would feel really excited to help them out. You know, if they were a good friend, you also have to gauge where are they in your circle of friends? Like I've mm -hmm. seen people just like post like I've seen people post like a uh, cast like a really wide net and I don't think, or they offer like pledge for pledge to like people they don't really know really well. I don't think that that necessarily works because the whole point of Patreon is you're getting your most excited fans like deeper into the world that you're mm -hmm. creating. So if these people are just there because you pledged back to them and they don't really care about what you're creating, then you're not going to get those great comments that you would get from someone that really is excited and really like does want to talk to you about well what kind of hair would this creature have and what kind of clothes would they wear in this environment you know what i mean like you have to like use your best judgment to decide what would be best but i think generally we as humans are just really self-critical of ourselves especially artists we get in our own head and we think that you know we we overthink things and we think that we're gonna you know do the wrong thing but i don't think that there's any harm in asking a question like that to somebody that is a good friend i mean like would you pledge to your patreon so if the answer mm -hmm. is yes then go ahead and ask and just like do it in like a non-pressure kind of way you know like asking someone to help you move. It's like, well, that's probably way more annoying. Cancel that. I didn't say that. Erase it. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, well, 
believe in you. Sorry, what was the last thing? Just asking someone to believe in you. And you can even leave it open-ended. Like, you can follow for free. And just, if you could leave me a comment every now mm-hmm. and then, that would really help. Mm-hmm. So if you're a little dumb shy about asking them for money, you could ask them to do that. That's free. That just costs a little bit of their time. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps the, the self-confidence too, if nothing else, you know, like just oh, have, yeah, yeah uh, that, that can be almost as much, if not maybe even, well, more <laughs> as, let's say as valuable as a monetary subscription, you know, just like having that confidence boost is, is huge. That can mean everything sometimes. That's like if, if artists are lacking in anything off most often it's self-confidence, you know, like the, the advice that I heard once that's sort of similar to what you're saying, you know, thinking about it as if you were somebody else is, um, you know, the advice to not shit on your own work because you wouldn't want somebody to shit on something that you like, you know, like, let's say you say, well, I, you know, I, I like that, that movie. And they're just like, that movie was terrible. You're so stupid for liking that. So you don't want somebody to say that about things that you like. So don't say it about yourself or the art that you make. Because then you're insulting all of the people that do like it. Anyway. That's a really um, good point. I'm glad that you mentioned it. And it, t- I think that it kind of, you know, it ties a little bit to what you were saying about, you know, like, well, it, would you subscribe to your own, your own Patreon? You know, like that's, that's probably a good indicator that you're doing something that you really enjoy and that other people are going to pick up on because it's like you, you feel, you feel strongly about it. Um, I just have, uh, I think, one more question um, before we start really wrapping it up. Um, and it's this idea of, like, once people are in and they, like, they, like they, they get that initial attraction into it, what kind of things do you do to, ha- like, help people feel, like, fully immersed? Like, they're, like, really part of it, you know, like, above just being excited about the idea and then wanting to contribute money to it, like, things that you do that, make them feel like they're actually in the world. So I actually put a lot of thought into this. Um, So as soon as anyone pledges at any level, as soon as I get the email, I send them a Patreon message, welcoming them to the realm and giving them like a little introduction into what Teratov is. So I've pre-made some posts on my Patreon that are public and, um, that have like a little synopsis of what the world is. And I have links to like collections of all of the most popular creatures. So Patreon lets you tag your posts. So let's say if um, somebody wanted to see all the artwork of dragons, well, I can send them a link that uh, includes the tag dragons and Patreon will populate all of those links. So I have a list of those uh, that they can see on the frequently asked questions post that is also included, Um, especially because when I started doing Patreon about three years ago, it was still very new. A lot of people like just did not, excuse me, know what they were doing. So I like pre-made all this information so that they can have that at their fingertips and to read. I also really like sending them a message because it's like me telling them, I see you, thank you. And it's not like an auto-generated thing. I actually send it myself. Um, Yes, I have the script pre-written, but I actually go into Patreon, find that person, put their name in there and give them this message myself. Because you know, when they pledge, Patreon says like, thank you, blah, blah, blah. But like, that's Mm -hmm. it. It's kind of, there's not like a whole lot of fanfare So I wanted to give them like a little bit of fanfare, even if it's just that. Um, I also, uh, in my next public post, I will welcome the new people. I have to admit, sometimes I don't always do this and I feel really bad about it. So I'm trying to get better at doing that. So I have a separate Google Doc where when somebody pledges to my Patreon, I take their name and I add it to the doc that's like need to greet And then in my next public post, I reference that and I'm like, who haven't I greeted yet? And then I do like a little welcome uh, section on the next public post. Uh, The other thing that I do, if they pledge $5 or more, part of their welcome to Teratov experience is they get a postcard from me and I handwrite 
like a little welcome message on all these postcards and I mail them out to them. And like for $5 once, like for one time thing, um, I'm perfectly comfortable doing that. I don't feel like it um, overburdens me at all. Mm -hmm. And actually the reason why I do that is because I love getting letters. I love um, getting mail that's not a bill. <laughs> so um, I know that for a lot of my patrons, that really means a lot. And when I make an Etsy order, I also will include a little handwritten note. I might get to the point where I'm just so wildly famous that I can't do that anymore, but <laughs> I can do it now. So I'm going to do it for those very special patrons that believed in me early on and they can hold on to them in their scrapbooks and sell them on eBay for thousands of dollars later. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I like, if it's if it, even if it's just like thanks for adopting this piece heather like i include like a little handwritten thing because i know that when i buy something from an artist and i get something handwritten like that that it really means a lot to me and i do save them so if people are weird like me and they like to save those things and i like to include them as well so it's i think a culmination of little things to let them know like hey i've seen you thanks for coming like this really means a lot um, and just trying to continually engage with them and get them involved, whether it's doing a poll to ask their opinion on something or posting a couple pieces and asking for their feedback about it or um, including their names in my YouTube videos and giving them a little shout out or um, I just try to do random stuff to recognize my patrons now and then. So for example, Last Christmas, um, my patron Inge has been my highest pledged patron since pretty much my launch. And she's been like such a huge support for me. And one of the things that we uh, worked on together for her reward was she got a custom story that we worked on together that takes place in the realm of Teratov. And in it, we created this little uh, cat character. So for Christmas, I sent her a painting of this cat character just like as a gift. And every once in a while, not everybody gets like a big painting like that, but every once in a while I'll like do something special for them. Um, I was working on a painting once on Twitch and I completely messed it up. And I was like, I'm gonna start over with this. I, I don't like it. And one of my patrons was in the chat and she was like, Oh, I actually really like that piece. Like, I actually think it's really cool. And so I, uh, she actually messaged me afterwards asking if she could buy it. Mm. And I lied to her and I said, oh, I threw it away. But what I'd actually done, was I had included it in her Patreon reward. And when she got it in the mail, she was like, you little trickster, you. You told me <laughs> you threw it away. I'm like, it's a present for you, actually. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. to be personal with them you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah really like that that personal touch is invaluable can never be underestimated um i think that uh we're out of questions and um the only i actually have three. Oh, well then three follow-ups i have uh, two I've of them are related okay. though been silly again <laughs> All right, so these are financial questions, so feel free to um, go into as much or as little detail as you want. But we talked about uh, pin drives and uh, uh, hiring a video editor. So I was curious, oh. like, approximately how much do you, would you expect to spend on those two things? Because you, you said that, uh, pin drives were a little too far out of your range right now, whereas the um, video editor was something that you were pursuing. So how would someone know how much they were going to have to spend on those, uh, you know, to whatever degree of specificity you're willing to talk about? Okay, so um, in order to, so the problem with me is my pins, my art is very complicated. So when that translates into making pins, um, they need a lot of lead time to make my pins because they are just too beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> they have too like much going on. So um, I need a lot of lead time to be able to produce a pin. And um, I want to be in the place where I can order like a year's worth of pins at a time and then just have them ready to ship out. And it really doesn't become financially feasible to 
buy pins unless you're buying like at least a hundred of the pin because as you buy more the price per unit goes down so if you're only buying like 10 pins then they're gonna be like i don't know maybe ten dollars a pin to make it mm -hmm. worth their time to make it mm -hmm. but if you're buying a hundred pins then you're getting closer to two two dollars a pin well that's still two hundred dollars and if i wanted to do 12 at a time so i could have a year's worth of pins ready and that's, you know, over $2,000, right? Am I doing the math right? Yes, over $2,000. Well, I don't have $2,000. I can just invest in pins at the moment. Someday, hopefully someday. Um, now, I could just order pins one at a time every month. Maybe that would work. But the idea of this extra lead time that I need to make my pins and not being able to deliver them on time really stresses me out. Mm -hmm. So. I really don't want to do that because I'm already um, not able to deliver the current page, uh, rewards that I have on a consistent schedule. So when I make the change, I'm going to make it to something I know that I can have ready to go and not have to think about or spend any more mental energy on because there's actually a lot of back and forth and work that goes into making pins. I mean, usually you're working with a manufacturer in China. So there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of communication that happens, and it can be very frustrating at times when you're trying to, you know, get your design to look the way you want it to, but they just don't understand. So that's about what you can look to, what you can expect to spend on pins, give or take how complicated your design is, what manufacturer you go to, how many colors you have, how big the pin is, yada, yada, yada. With the video editor, there's also um, a range because like, for example, when I was doing video work, um, if someone wanted to commission me to do a video, I would charge them $300 a day. I can't pay someone $300 a day to do the work. So what I did was I made uh, all of those assets ahead of time. And I spoke to an editor that I wanted to hire. And I said, look, how much would this cost? Because I've got all of these assets ready to go. You basically just need to like cut out the parts where like I sneeze and pick my nose and mm -hmm. put it all on the timeline and render it. Like how much would that cost? And I think I'm spending about $25 a video, which is a really great price. I think he might actually raise it uh, because um, that was kind of like the trial period price to see how we would work together and see like if he could feasibly do it for $25. The part that um, where I'm so like, you know, that graph that goes around where it has like um, the three different factors, like factors of making art. Like, is it good? Is it fast? And mm -hmm. the price. Yeah. Right. So he's good. I got that. And I got a great price. So I'm losing on the speed. Like the compromise is I get the video whenever I get it. I right. can't like be forcing him to prioritize this because I know I'm not paying him enough to be able to, you know, uh, take care of all of his financial obligations. So I understand that I am a lower priority on the totem pole of projects he has to do. So the more money you can invest in it, the faster the turnaround can be, which is, you know, why I started also editing videos because um, right now, I can't afford to pay him more and demand that he work faster. So we're just kind of working together. Uh, a follow up to that, going back to the enamel pin thing, um, you mentioned doing a Kickstarter at, in the future involving pins, right? Is there a way, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but is there is there a way to connect the two? To, so like the, you do a Kickstarter for pins, and then that gets you your big bulk order for pins. And then you can also then pivot those pins into Patreon tiers. Well, so I think the way that that could work is, um, see, the thing is, if you're going to run a Kickstarter for pins, chances are a lot of your backers are already going to be patrons. Mm -hmm. So you could... I don't think they would be very happy if you if they bought the pin on Kickstarter and then the same pin was their reward on their Patreon reward. No, sure. I guess I was thinking about 
for future patrons? Oh. Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to come back to you with that. But what <laughs> okay. I would probably do if I was going to do that now is like what, what my hope is. I hope that this pen Kickstarter is really, really good. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that pin Kickstarters can really take off even if you don't have a huge audience. So what I would like to do is reinvest some of that profit that I get from that Kickstarter into potentially investing it into more pins uh, yeah. or this other Patreon reward that I have planned. But I would totally keep the art separate. You know what I mean? Like I mm -hmm. would just like kind of make the Kickstarter its own thing and make the pins a different thing because um, I would be worried about patrons that had pledged to the Kickstarter getting the same reward again. Yeah, no, um, I definitely. If, I, yeah. Yeah. If it was a Kickstarter that I did like tomorrow and then a year from now I get a new patron. And what I could conceivably do is um, like once I feel confident that the that run of pins has made its way through my Patreon audience and everyone who's gotten one has gotten it. I could use that same design as a perk for like a first time sign up so that they know that when they get, when they sign up, that that's the pin they're going to get. So it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. and they're not like, Oh, I already had this one. Right. 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 All right. So I think that's how I would handle it. Your second, you got a second follow up moose. Yeah. So this is in regard to, um, YouTube videos and, uh, with the uh, nailing the algorithm so that um, uh, this isn't so much a question. It was more of a tip, uh, <laughs> of, but uh, there's this channel called how to cook that. And you wouldn't think this has anything to do with uh, viral videos, but they go out there and they debunk fake cooking videos. <laughs> the people will uh, do weird things like they'll cover an egg in chocolate syrup, put it in the microwave, and then it comes out as a chocolate cake. Okay. And these videos are getting like tens of millions of views and they're making tons of money, but they're what? just kind yeah, they're just content farms out there in like Southeast Southeast Asia or in uh, Russia, right? And they have t dozens of channels, if not hundreds of these channels, just by the same people that make them. Uh, but she has one video that came out uh, about a month ago. It was called like eight. Uh, let, me, let me pull up the exact name of it. Exposing eight viral video tricks that will blow your mind is the name of the video. And they actually go, it starts the video as any other video that they, they, they do is debunks examples of a uh, of fraud, fraudulent uh, video recipes. And then it goes into detail about how they choose their titles, how they choose their, uh, their cover photos and uh, how they produce content at such a high volume. And I'm thinking if, these people are doing nonsense and making uh, millions of dollars just by make, making uh, videos that you know have no validity in reality. Uh, then people that are actually making art might have something to learn from these people that when they're actually when they make something that's you know actually useful. Hmm. So w learn from the evil people and then make it your own with uh, for the power of good. Use it for good. Let's remind me. Let's put a link to yes. those videos in the show notes in the future. Um, Please. yeah, definitely. That sounds really interesting. All right. Did you have a, one more question, Moose? I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. No, the uh, other question was tied in with the uh, video editor cost and the uh, cost of pins. Oh, okay, cool. Right on. Um, well, the, fi the final thing for you, Heather, uh, not including anything related to Teratov or your own personal projects what's something that's going on in the world that you're really excited about in the world <laughs> the whole um, world the universe can i tell you something fun i did for halloween yeah absolutely yeah oh my god so i had the best halloween that i ever had as an adult ever was staying at home so um do either of you guys play animal crossing no, my mom loves it. She's addicted. She plays it every day, but not me. So do I. It's part of my wellness ritual. Like so I try try to play Animal Crossing mindfully. I've been reading this book all about mindfulness, um, and it talks a lot about how we get like really 
uh, we get really distracted by multitasking and that part of the reason that we might feel stressed is because our attention is actually pulled in multiple places. And I got uh, Animal Crossing when the pandemic started and then I kind of got like bored of it because I was like um, just you know, I was moving on. But then I realized that while I was playing Animal Crossing, I was also doing things like checking my Facebook and watching a YouTube in the background or listening to a Twitch stream. And I wasn't really focused on the point of that game, which is to just like relax and be in the moment of this like repetitive action in a soothing environment. So I made a commitment to start doing that to kind of like help me uh, ease into a good um, like headspace in the morning. And I actually found it really does help so um, they announced that they're going to be doing a Halloween event. And I was like, oh, that sounds fun. And I thought it would be a really cool idea to have some of my friends come to my island and play with me. So uh, how this game works is uh, you build an island and you customize it. And your friends who play the game can also come and visit your island and explore it and interact with the things that you build. So I built a haunted house and I spent like about a month like putting it all together and making like all these little like surprises and hidden treats and little games <laughs> that we could play. And I invited my friends that I know that play Animal Crossing to come and join me. But the secret sauce was I also set up my first Discord. Don't all come rushing to it because it was only set up for this and I'm still learning how Discord works. So if you go there now, all you'll see is like the Animal Crossing Halloween party, but maybe it'll be a thing later. But I invited them all to come to a voice chat so we could like chat while we played the game. And it was actually like really wholesome, awesome fun. Like we had a couple people that are really uh, new to Animal Crossing. So like everything was like new and amazing to them. They're like, wow, you have a bridge? I don't have a bridge. Oh my goodness. You have like a bird in a like a little bird cage? That's adorable. And like we just started talking about the game and um I gave them a tour of the house and each of the rooms had like a theme and a story. And one of them was like based off like a nightmare I had as a child. So I got to like tell them the story. And like as other people came and went uh onto the island, the people who were previously there got to experience the new people seeing the haunted house for the first time and it was like a four hour long just like wholesome party with my friends on animal crossing and i actually got to talk to human beings which was amazing huh. so it was just so fun and i'm really sad that it's over because it was just like it was the social interaction that i really needed like as an extrovert i'm starving for it so that was really fun and I love Animal Crossing and I can't wait to see what their Christmas event will be so that maybe I can do something fun like that for Christmas as well. Well, there's wow. only 364 days until next Halloween. Uh, I messed <laughs> mess that up. I was going to say 365 and then have somebody corrected me. 364. <laughs> well, and let that let that be a, a testament to the power of Heather's storytelling and the ability to create <laughs> a wonderful environment that will make many people happy. Um, if that's not a selling point, I don't know what is. Heather, thank you so much for spending time with us. You are a joy to talk to. So much great information that I hope will be helpful for other people. And you got a, a new patron out of it. So I think I feel like everybody won today. Everyone's happy. It's been a great day. Yeah, we'll definitely have you on again I'm in so the future. Yeah, we'll definitely have you on again in the future to talk about uh, you know, kind of to catch it up follow up on some of the things that we hit on today that have future plans involved. Um, but uh, until then, I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to hit end on this recording. Thank you again, Heather. Thanks for and, having me. Yeah. And